About two months ago, I was driving in a car full of children, ranging in age from three to 11. And a three-year-old was sitting right behind me, and the car was filled with all kinds of chatter, you can imagine. We were on our way to get burgers, I should say. That's an important part of this story. I'm sorry, oh. And just for the sake of stimulating conversation and maybe our appetites as well, I said to the car full, what do you like on your burgers? And it filled the car with all kinds of thoughts about, I like grilled onions, grilled onions are gross, I like mushrooms, mushrooms are gross, you know, the whole, you can imagine, 11 year olds, 10 year olds, 8 year olds talking. And then there was a little hush, and the three year old right behind me, she said, Anna? Yes, Odelia? What do I want? And the rest of the car got quiet. The 11 year old girls and the eight year olds, oh, they got so quiet. We sat, something happened in the car. Something changed. What is it to ask that question of somebody else from a three-year-old? What do I want? And in that moment, I could feel she gave such a gift. She actually brought us, in a way, into the Garden of Eden. Her, her selfhood was totally united with mine. My desires were her desires. My wish for her will was hers, united. She, in utter not knowing, depended fully on my knowing. And then I turned to my daughter, 11 years old, and I said, you've been awfully quiet. What do you feel like? What kind of burger do you want? And she turned to me with a little twinkle in her eye, and she said, what makes you think I want a burger at all? <laughs> Okay, we're not in Eden anymore. <laughs> so, interesting, I've been reflecting on this for quite some time. What does this tell us about the human being? This development, this change in consciousness, one so dependent, so united with another, and then one forging independence and finding their own eye, their own voice, their own wishes, desires, and so on. And that's just the beginning of the story. So through the eyes of anthroposophy and through the gifts that Rudolf Steiner has given us, I would like to take a look at what was being revealed in that scenario. And as a picture of a larger scenario, all of our children and all of our lives unfolding. And how can that lens help us understand how best to educate a young person. So I'm going to begin in 1906 with this book, The Education of the Child in Light of Spiritual Science. This is a, it was a booklet that, that Rudolf Steiner wrote, um, not a lecture, and it was a collection, reflections on his work as a tutor. He was hired as the personal private tutor of a young boy named Otto Specht, who had hydrocephalic syndrome and he was deemed ineducable by his parents and teachers. And his parents hired this tutor. I guess they didn't think he was so ineducable, they wouldn't hire a tutor. So they hired Rudolf Steiner to work with him. And over the years, he found a way to work with this young person so effectively that he actually became able to enter a public school and became actually a doctor eventually. He, he healed the condition and through that, more than anything, he said that he learned about a pedagogical approach that, that this young boy taught him and, and which he then poured out in this, in this um, writing about the human being and its fourfold nature and its threefold nature and how that could be a uh, helpful approach to educating 
young people. And in 1906, this, this writing fell basically on deaf ears. Nobody took it up at the time. No one took it up and said, let's start a school. This sounds great. Let's find a new pedagogy and create a new, a new way forward in education. It, it slept until right after World War I. So 1919, what's that, 15 years or so had passed. And by that point, Rudolf Steiner had been lecturing and writing and speaking about the threefold social order. And a man named Emil Molt took interest. He was a student of Rudolf Steiner's. And he attended a lecture that Rudolf Steiner was speaking about, the threefold social order and the, the potential for a new, a new way of organizing culture, culture and politics and economics that would be truly socially just. And this, this was very interesting to Emil Molt. He had big social questions. He was a cigarette factory owner at the Waldorf Astoria Cigarette Factory and in Stuttgart, Germany. And he was deeply concerned about a way forward for, for society in the aftermath of a terribly destructive war that left, that left his country and many others in ruins. And so he went to Rudolf Steiner and asked, what can be done? How do we take this up? And the idea of a school was born. First it went toward adult education, and then it became clear that really the way forward was to start a school to educate the children of the factory workers. And thus the first Waldorf School was born in 1919 after a very short time of teacher training, and there were, there were four important conditions that I want to name before Rudolf Steiner said yes to this idea. He said, yes, but it must be co-educational. It needs to be comprehensive in its scope, that it's not a narrow focus of education, that it's actually a full education, not specialized or narrowly focused. And that there was no entrance exam, that it would be for all who wished for it. And finally, and maybe most importantly, that those involved in the decisions that affect the children as much as possible need to be the teachers who teach them. And we, we say that now and think that's so obvious, of course, but actually in most school systems, I would say it's, it's a rare case that the teachers are the deciding factor when it comes to pedagogical decisions, at least in a public school situation. And so the school was born and Waldorf education began to spread. In 1928, the first school in in the United States was founded, the Rudolf Steiner School in New York City. And Waldorf schools, after a brief period of closing during, in Europe during World War II, they reopened and spread. And they spread to, to, and are still spreading in many different cultures, languages, religions, all kinds of places where we can, we can wonder, well, what's the common thread? What's the common factor? What ties them together? What makes it Waldorf? And I think it's important to say that it isn't a formula. It isn't a, um, a pedagogy. It isn't a curriculum that's codified, actually. It is, a, it is a set of ideas. It is a way of thinking about the human being and a belief that the best way to, to achieve our highest goals of education are bound up with our understanding of the human being. In fact, one of my very favorite quotations from Rudolf Steiner about education was to a group of parents and teachers right after the opening of the first school. And he was sort of orienting everybody to what this whole thing was. He said, if we really want to know what to do as educators, we should turn our attention not to the state, not to the economy, but 
to what is universally human and, and its requirements. So we could ponder what is universally human. It's a big question. It's very hard to get at that. We're very busy noticing, for good reasons, all of our differences and uniqueness, as we should. But his work was getting at what is actually universally human. At least part of his work was that. So I want to look at that tonight and see how does an understanding of that sort of put his words to the test? How does his understanding and understanding of that lead us to a healthy, helpful, pedagogical approach? Before I do that, though, I think I, think I because of the title of this talk, I need to say a word about anthroposophy and Rudolf Steiner himself. And how do we understand what that is and how does it relate to Waldorf education? So certainly don't have the time tonight to give a whole biographical picture of his life, which is incredibly interesting, but should be the topic of another talk perhaps. But I will say he was, he was a scientist trained at, the, at a technical institute in Vienna. He was an artist. He was a philosopher, PhD in philosophy. And he spent time thinking about how to know, how do we, how can one, can one know the spiritual world? As a young person, he had spiritual experiences. And he sought and forged a new way at relating to those experiences. New, at least for our modern consciousness. So rather than relating to those experiences in a kind of mediumistic, perhaps semi-conscious way, or through a kind of religious dogmatism of the day, instead, he forged a path of knowing a path that every human being could walk. Not one especially for initiates, not one especially for certain people with special gifts, but he founded what became known as spiritual science. And it is truly that, a science in that it is both a methodology and the collected results of his research. The methodology we could find in a number of his books, perhaps the most well-known is How to Know Higher Worlds. Some of you, I'm sure, know that book. And in the very beginning, he describes the fact that this path is a path of knowing available to any human being in any situation of life. And the collected results of his research, incredibly interesting and informative and helpful, and has a certain <coughs> danger associated with it if we don't pay attention to the methodology. And that is that all of these lectures he gave, pouring out his insights into the spiritual world and how those insights can be helpful in, the, in our daily lives, he was a deeply practical person, did not want these ideas to stay theoretical. The danger is that this collected results of research can become a belief system, which he did not want, I don't think. I think he would have wanted us to lean heavily on the methodology side, on becoming knowers ourselves. And he was, he was deeply influenced by Goethe. He had an opportunity to, he had the assignment to edit his scientific writings. And that work informed him informed his whole worldview and his whole path of knowing. Which I think, I, how, how, how could I possibly sum up in one sentence, but I'm going to try. So hopefully the nutshell contains a nut that holds the whole tree, but I don't know. So this is the sentence I, I, think, I think might do justice to sum it up. And that is that he he is looking, he was looking himself, and can lead us on a path of knowing and loving, truly knowing what is seen, what is seen in our daily life, in our world, in the flowers, in the minerals, in each other, in the animal kingdom, 
And through that kind of knowing and devotion to what is seen, the unseen will reveal itself. It can reveal itself. And so uniting these two worlds and not finding a spiritual, mystical life and a life on earth that are separate, but that through one you can reach through to the other. And that we all have organs of perception in various stages of development that will be just like the sense organs that we have, our eyes, our ears, and so on, spiritual organs that we can develop, the chakras. So anthroposophy then became, and spiritual science, a way into knowing. Knowing the spiritual world, knowing the world we live in. And as I mentioned, the deeply practical part of him responded to questions from many directions. How can we take this, these ideas and bring them in, into life? into the arts, into education, into the raising of, of um, crops, into agriculture, into architecture, into movement. Eurythmy was born out of that. Into speech and drama, into medicine, and all manner of fruits on the tree were born into the world that have their own lives in the world today including, and maybe most visibly in the world, Waldorf education. Yeah, so you could say it's a fruit on the tree of anthroposophy. Anthropos, Sophia. Anthropos means human. Sophia, wisdom. So the wisdom of the human being. The trunk of the tree, you could say. The roots going deep into, into the mysteries and brought forth in our time for everybody, every human, in the fruits of our hopefully renewed culture. Or at least a culture in need of renewal on so many fronts. So perhaps we can take a look now at what his picture of the human being was. And I have to say, because I just talked about how his, the results of his research could so easily become a belief system, I have to say I only speak about this because I have found in my living as a, as a teacher and as a parent and my own life experience as a human being, I have found there to be truth in what he had to say about the development of the human being. And so I offer my experience, perhaps his words, you could say, affirmed through my life experience that I put out there for you to do with what you wish. Um, it, is, it is, yeah, a free um, approach to knowing that everyone must take. It is really one of the main underpinnings of anthroposophy that one comes toward it completely freely. Nevertheless, I feel it's important to, to offer it out for you to get to know. Yeah, so that's where we're headed. I am going to just slide this over a bit and see, everyone can see this. Am I, is this blocking you here? You're okay? So some of you have heard this perhaps in in talks I've given or other people have given. So let's say none of it's new. Um, and it should feel familiar because you're a human. And if it doesn't resonate with your own life experience, then, then maybe it needs looking at again. But I want to start with a kind of morph morphology, with the, what Steiner first put out as this threefold human being, a very fundamental idea born out of anthroposophical human understanding. And if we see the roundness of the head as one form, we, 
we can notice the joints in the head are sutured. They're not meant for movement. The head in its beautiful roundness is meant to be still. It's actually not meant to be used as a limb. When we use it as a limb, we get a concussion. I mean, don't tell anyone who plays soccer that, but I mean, I'm just saying, I think that's kind of a thing. So, um, so we have a kind of still, round, and we have even sayings in our vernacular about calm, cool, and collected in our thinking, right? When, uh, when we get heat up here, we're sick, we have a fever. It's meant to be the pole of our being that's cool, you could say. And of course, the activity associated with our heads is thinking. And let's go to the complete opposite pole of the human being, the limbs. We'll just look at our limbs are long bones that radiate out, that have hinge joints and ball, ball and socket joints that are meant for movement, meant for a wide range of movement, exactly opposite the head. You could say too, in the head, the, the bony structure is outside and the soft tissue is inside, exactly the opposite. The soft tissue is outside on the limbs and the bony structure is inside. So a kind of complete, um, transformation. This, this person's going to have a really big head, so <laughs> anyway, that's just the way it's going to go tonight. <laughs> and in our limbs, right, meant for movement, you could say for our, yeah, for our, uh, the transformation of substance, Steiner connects our limbs with our metabolic system. So you have nerve sense, And you have the metabolic. This is where we take things in, even in our metabolism, completely transform them. We do that with our hands, or we can do that with our hands. We can do that in, in our work in the world. In our, the activity associated with our limbs, in our will, our doing, our volition. And in between the two, we have this, these beautiful bones in our ribs that, that, are, that are neither straight nor fully round. A little bit of both poles find themselves in expression in our ribs. And we have this, I just can't bear it, the head's too big. <laughs> we have this, <laughs> this mediating rhythmical system. the heart, the lungs, that, that mediate between upper and lower, that mediate between what's outside of me, what's inside of me, and that have a rhythm. They can go a little faster and they can get a little slower, but it never stops. When it stops, we die, we expire. So this, this ongoing rhythm, okay, now I have to really work on this right here just so that Got a big belly here. Okay, hands. All right, you get the idea. And in our, in our middle sphere, the way we relate to the world, through our heart, through our interactions here, is through the life of feeling that has its home in our heart. So, So this is the, the circulatory system and the, the heart and the breathing. And we could say when we're in pursuit of what is universally human, that to be human, every single human being is going to recognize themselves in this picture, I would, see, I would think. And every single human being in this threefold organization has a spirit, has a soul, 
and has a body. And this, you could say, is what is eternal in us. And this is what is temporal, our physical body. And the soul's job is to mediate between the two, both between the spirit and the soul, and you could say between the other and itself. It's when we, when we are moved. We're not physically moved, but our soul is moved in relationship to something. When we are, when we are moving between in our spirit, let's say in, in sleep, when we kind of leave our body in sleep and we come into our body, there's a soul movement. So thinking, feeling, and willing are kind of, I guess, coined as terms that Steiner called forces of the soul. Thinking, feeling, and willing. And this is where we're concerned in education. We are not educating the spirit. We are working with the forces of the soul, thinking, feeling, and willing. And I think Waldorf educators would agree that all three of these soul forces deserve an education. And in our current world, we look upon education in what I would call a very bipolar way. We, we see education as what happens here. And we have a sense culturally for an education of the will, how obsessed our culture is with, with um, maybe that's a strong word, obsessed, how uh, committed our culture is to athletics and to starting at younger and younger ages for, for games and all of the sport activities that we want our children to thrive at. All those understandable and good and, and worthy but perhaps we could say overemphasized, one-sided, I don't know, it's a question. We could look at that in relationship to this kind of, yeah, you could say we get this, we have, a, we have a sense of what this is in the world, not a very healthy one, I would say, and we have a sense of what it is to educate the will, but very little understanding in our educational practices in our, I mean, in the wider society, of how to educate the life of feeling, how to educate a human being through, in a, in a helpful way, that doesn't probe into their psychology too soon or in too invasive of a way, but how can an education actually help them relate in a meaningful way to the world they're in and to one another? So relationship is, is a very big, um, I guess its home is here in this middle part, in this rhythmical life, in this life of feeling. And I think, and this is just me observing um, our culture, I think we've left a lot of the education of our life of feeling to the media and to those experiences that, that perhaps are a little bit detached from human relationships. And, carved out largely from our, our school systems. And this is where Waldorf education, in my, in my view, offers something that is to be found nowhere else. And that is because it understands when you are here in your thought process, you relate to yourself. It can be one-sided and lonely. And when you are in the world, in your will, working out there, you meet the world. And you can also get lost in the world. A kind of extreme picture of this is depression and mania. And what weaves the two together is a, is a rich, under artistic experience of educating through a sense of feeling and relationship. And I would say through this, when we can get this right, we can actually have a chance at 
orienting people, young people growing up to a world that actually is meaningful and that they can find a relationship to that world. And that sounds, maybe that sounds trivial, but I think in today's world where there are truly epidemics of teenage suicide and depression, I think we can't overlook the role that our education has in bringing along this life of feeling. We'll talk a little bit more about that when it comes up in the grades. So if we were to take this now and put it in time and start with birth, how do we see this picture as unfolding? I'm going to just erase this. Is that all right? We can. Um, <clears throat> And the, the first thought I want to share is one of just looking at the word incarnation. It means to be coming into flesh. And I think it's a very helpful word and a very helpful concept because we understand the idea looking at the physical body of growing up. And if we were to look at from the point of view of the spirit, we're actually growing down into a body. So you could say the, the experience of starting small and getting bigger is one of the physical body. The experience of starting as big as the cosmos and coming smaller into a body is an incarnation process of the soul spirit being into a physical body. And that's a long, difficult process for a human being, going from the infinite to the finite, from timeless eternity into the temporal. And I think through Waldorf, I know through Waldorf education, that incarnation process can be well served, can be helped, and that education is looked at as a support for the stages along the way of that incarnation process. So, with that, I want to just put this, I feel like, I don't know, can you see okay? Yeah? Put this, this picture now in time and begin, begin with birth. A physical body born, seems like out of nowhere, suddenly there's somebody there. And this physical body then has its first cycle of taking the inherited substance from mother and father and turning it over and making it his or her own. It takes about seven years or so to turn over every cell in the human body. And by about six or seven, the hardest substance in the body has been pushed out, or at least wiggled, and that is the teeth. And that simply tells us, that's the body telling us that it is finished with a certain process. Those formative forces, which Steiner calls the etheric forces, these forces of life body, the, the forces of growth and renewal, those, those forces, which are part and parcel of our growing, little growing bodies and our sustaining of our healing and healthy human bodies, those forces have a job in those first six, seven years. And that job is to complete the physical organs, to, to grow and turn over every cell in the body to make it its own. And we can interrupt that process. And we do all the time when we quiz our children. Because what we're doing is tapping their memory. And once these etheric, once this etheric, E-H-E-R-I-C, once this etheric is born, certain forces, those growth forces that were busy on the physical body are now freed up for something else. 
memory, learning. That's why these young children in the first few grades can memorize all those times tables in that moment, in that time. They can memorize all the parts of a play, not just their own, right? You see second graders doing a play and they're mouthing everybody else's part in addition to speaking their own. The forces of memory are so powerful and they're unleashed. There's, they're born into, into a, a kind of new stage because they're done with their job. And that is why kindergarten teachers do not do a lot of instruction, formal instruction, you could say, direct instruction. They're leaving those formative forces to do the job they need to do. And don't tap the memory too early. They will, they will keep the child in a kind of timeless space and, and not go straight on one-to-one -one with drilling. What are the colors? What are the letters? What are the sounds? What are the numbers? What color is the sky? What color? You, the children get quizzed all day long. And that kind of quizzing taps those memory forces, that etheric body that has a job. And so what the kindergarten teachers are busy doing is not teaching through direct instruction, but they sure are instructing through their will, through their doing, through the way in which they've penetrated their gestures, their words, their feelings and thoughts and their mood in the classroom whenever they're around the children. How, how they've ritualized and formalized life at the table. If you've ever been to a snack at a kindergarten table, is glorious, like high tea. The manners, unbelievable. It is, it's such a joy, the way they tell stories and retell stories and formalize and ritualize. And through imitation, they're teaching through doing because the imitative forces of the young child are so strong. They're harnessed by the teacher and parents in these early years. So I'm, I imagine their motto is less talk, more do. Or less, if not talk, less instruction, more doing. <laughs> and less talk. <laughs> yeah. So we could say this is, this is the first kind of arc we're looking at um, leading us to this turning point, this this is one birth, you could say. This second birth of, of what we call the etheric body or the life body. And then we come to the next phase. And, and I just want to pause to say this picture is a kind of everyone and no one. It's, a, it's an archetype. It is, it is the, yeah, if there's a, a theme, we are all variations on this theme. But it is helpful to have a theme, <laughs> to know where we are and to find ourselves in time. So this next phase, we could, we could say, is the next seven years, from six to seven to about 13 to 14. And here we ha have the authority of a teacher of, and a group of teachers, not just one. Also, you could say the authority of the parents. And this isn't authority coming out of power. This is an authority coming out of a wish to, this is what I call it, like, like to drive the car with the passengers in it, and I know where I'm going, and I have a story to tell on the way. And until you learn how to drive the car, and then you can drive it yourself. And children can relax when they know that there's an authority who, who has a handle on things, who has actually boundaries around things. Then they can go in and relax. And, and Rudolf Steiner gives this wonderful picture that the class teacher, this is the time of this class teacher from first to eighth grade, you could say, or class teachers, depending on the situation, where the class teacher bridges the abyss between the child and the world, which they can't quite learn directly from yet because they are young. They can't quite drive the car themselves yet until they're 16, right? But they can be a passenger in the car and they depend heavily on the driver. And that's my analogy, but his was that in this situation, he says the teacher 
the author of the story of this learning, is the world. That's a big statement. That's a powerful statement for a teacher to, to live with. And if you think about it, how, how is that the case? I, I pondered that for some time, feeling the weight of that responsibility. And in a way, you could say the class teacher's job is to, is to frame the door that we walk through for every subject. And to kind of say, hmm, we're coming up to botany. All right, how are we going to enter this so that, so that the world of the plants becomes meaningful and alive and related to me as a human being? And that's the question with every subject that's entered, building a relationship of meaning to it with one another and with whatever it is we're studying. And so the class teacher is this generalist who just loves the world and everything in it and finds wonder and enthusiasm and interest in so many different things that, that are our world, the phenomena that surround us. And can, with enthusiasm, invite those things to be in the classroom with us in our descriptions and our explorations, in our artistic way. Yeah, and what's happening in the constitution of the human being at that time, just like something was asleep, or, or, or left alone, working in, in gestation, the same thing here, until the sexual organs are mature, which is signaled to us at puberty, maybe that's more like here than there these days, when the sexual organs are mature, it's a signal to us the forces that have been incubating in, in this human being are now ripened and ready for a, a third birth, ready to be born. And with that birth comes new capacities, just like the capacities for memory were born through the etheric birth, new capacities. So if you think about it, it's actually kind of staring at us right there in the face. When puberty happens, a, chi a, a child, a young person can be a creative human being that actually can create life. And I think we could look at that in an educational sense and see they can, out of this inner space that they have, this inner life that's now become more their own, things can be born in a creative way into the world. They can also begin to think critically. They can begin to take bits of things and put them together, just begin. And and perhaps create in a, in a cre yeah, create through language, through music, through ideas, something born out of themselves in a way they couldn't before. Although in our current educational system in the world, we ask that of younger and younger and younger children, more and more and more, to tap again something that hasn't really been born yet in them, and we try to draw it out and draw it out and draw it out. And it has consequences. Doing that has consequences. And so when we see this birth, born out of the adolescent is a world of feeling, inner life, that's accessible to them now, and hopefully useful. It can be destructive. And our hope through the way we educate is to give them experiences through all kinds of stories and all kinds of human history and cultural exploration and artistic exploration and drama, that they run the gamut of soul experience that, that, that belongs to, to the human being. <clears throat> so many ways we can do that in every day that we educate the children. So when this is born, this Rudolf Steiner called the astral body. Well, he didn't call it that. These aren't words he made up. These are words from theosophical terminology. Um, we could call it the life of feeling, desires, w wishes, wants. We recognize that with the adolescent. Something is there that wasn't there before, or at least in not as powerful a way. And new capacities. And as soon as any new capacity is there, it's incumbent upon us as teachers and parents to exercise it with vigor, to really work it and strengthen that muscle and make use of it. And if we don't, it's, it's, it kind of um, becomes this, it becomes problematic. It kind of 
presents itself in the classroom as, as a substance that isn't being met, isn't used. We can see it right away. As a, if you're a teacher and you're sensitive to this, that begins to be your signal that, oh, we got to push a little farther. We have to go a little further. We have to widen this exploration, deepen it. And what comes next then is <coughs> high school and beyond. And this is where the learner wants to be met by someone who has specialized, who is an expert, who has taken a passion for one thing, deepened it, and presents themselves as a knower of this craft or this field of study. And the expert in a field. And now you can see the 16-year-old, the 17-year-old, the has the capacity to learn directly from life and has these newly born potential for critical thinking to synthesize the many parts, to seek through that capacity truth. And so we could say this whole phase, what's, what's in gestation there is, is the self, the I, sometimes called the ego. <clears throat> and, you know, it's not as though one wakes up on their 21st birthday fully fledged, autonomous, sovereign human being. <laughs> but something's born in them during this phase of life that points in that direction of not the three-year-old who's so bound up with the other in utter dependence, but now the potential for a sovereign human being who can direct themselves in the pursuit of truth. And that truth, the capacity to seek the truth is, is built upon an ability to relate to the world and to be interested in the world and find beauty in the world and the other. And that is also has its roots in a love of humanity and that the world is good or why bother? And it's so easy. And when, remember what I was saying, there's a cost, right? There's, there are consequences to what we are doing in our world today, which is taking the future and pressing it farther and farther back. The consequence is Cynicism, at best, nihilism, is there for sure. Meaninglessness, giving up on humanity. And I think it is, it is, I'm so glad that Laura put this letter out. I don't know how many of you read this um, invitation to come tonight by email the other day. I think it was uh, over the weekend. Speaking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his wish to... I, his belief in, in that which is good, truly good in the human, in the human being. And, and his sense that the purpose, I think, of education, I won't quote it exactly, but to say is to think vigorously, I think it was, and critically, and, and to develop one's character that those, those were articulated by him as the aims of education. And I think that the, yeah, the, the best way that I can find to get to that is to honor and respect the true unfolding of the human being in the process of education. And we could go in to each of these areas and look at specifically pedagogically, how do we do that? How do you do that in fifth grade? How do you do that in 10th grade? That would be fun to do, I think, together. But for, for the purposes of today, I want to just spread this out before you and add a kind of a layer on top that just comes from my own observation, you know, kind of, yeah, just noticing. There's a correct impulse for the young child 
to protect from, from the parents and teachers. There is a lot to protect them from in our world, for sure. And it's easy to lose sight of the moment when that protect becomes overprotect. And you could say, coming from the other direction, there's an impulse here that is also correct for the young adult. And that is to expose them directly to life. Yes, they must have it. And what happens to the young people, and I, I brought this picture to 12th graders once, part of this. And it resonated so strongly with their own experience that one of them looked at this and said, like, welcome to my world. This overprotect, because the problem is, we do this at the same time. We protect, it's good, it's good, we overprotect. We expose, and that's good, but we overexpose too much too soon. Hypersexualization is a result of that. And there are driving forces on both sides that I think are helpful to just name. And this is, this is a kind of ambition. And this is fear. And what's in the middle that holds the balance of these two things, moment to moment, is, is this is going to sound cliche, <laughs> but it's love. And, and the kind of love, so there's a phrase that Steiner gave when he described Waldorf education. He said, you can, you can educate in three ways. You can educate through ambition, through fear, and through love. And in Waldorf education, we forswear the first two. And I've examined this in my own life of teaching and parenting, and it's very hard not to bring in any elements of ambition and any elements of fear into daily life. They're there. And then the question really is, arises. Okay, so knowing that those, those realities are in my daily life, where is this? And what does that look like? What does it look like to educate out of love? Is not a sympathetic love that simply gives you whatever you want, that just says yes all the time. Perhaps it's the love that has the courage to throw down a boundary and say no. Or we could think of any number of situations, any number of ways to, to characterize what it is to educate out of love. And I, 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 would, I would say that love is also Inherent in love is knowing, knowing the other, that you are loving. And knowing the, the layers of the human being that are unfolding and respecting them in the course of the education is an act of love. And the whole world is pushing like a tidal wave against this picture, pushing from the future down faster, earlier equals smarter, and all of these things. And those who then follow this picture, believe me, I'm living it in so completely right now. You are, you, you have to, it requires a certain kind of courage to, to, to stand in this sort of a picture. So I, I commend you Waldorf parents for taking that, recognizing that somehow. And many other teachers who actually teach through this, I don't even know they're doing it, but just have a sense humanly of what is right. In some of the workshops I've led, I've had teachers sit in the back of the room and they're, they're kind of afraid to be present. I'm thinking, yeah, this person is an educator, born and called to be an educator. And she, she, was, yeah, she was talking in the back about how she's in a public school in New York City and Many of her curricula are scripted for her, so she, she's trying to find little tiny ways when she turns around and faces the board, how can she express some, some bit of creativity? Because what, what her feeling was in the moment was, what I'm, what I'm doing is actually 
not, I'm not able to fulfill an education out of this tr picture which she recognized as true. And it felt to her like a moral trespass. And she needed to find another way at this. So I, I commend, there are so many wonderful teachers. This isn't just for Waldorf in the classroom. This is just a, a picture of what could make an education, any education, really good, really healthy and helpful. And back to my three-year-old, not my three-year-old, but the three-year-old in my car, I thought I was very moved by this, um, the opening paragraph of, of this pamphlet, this lecture that Rudolf Steiner gave uh, when was this? Um, in 1905, so just a year before this education of the child, called Brotherhood and the Survival of the Fittest. Those are two interesting concepts to place next to each other. And he said in the opening paragraph, those of you who have occupied yourselves even a little with the aims of our spiritual scientific movement know our main principle to create the heart, the kernel of a brotherhood based on all embracing human love that transcends race, sex, profession, religion, and so on. Spiritual science, he goes on to say, considers this great ethical striving toward brotherhood to be most closely connected with the ultimate aim of human development. And when I read that, I thought the ultimate aim of human development of this I is to find itself in brotherhood with the other, in kinship, in fellowship, brotherhood, sisterhood, I mean that broadly, out of its free, fully fledged I, independent, not dependent. So it was easy for the three-year-old to find fellowship with the other. She can't help it. It's unfree in a way. It's certainly true to her consciousness. But how can we find each other after we are in, you know, our me, me, me generation? What was it like the me generation in the 80s and then the me, me, me generation or whatever it was, right? Like we just can't get enough of ourselves. Like thank you, Facebook, we made little narcissists out of every one of us. That's the shadow side of a truth, which is that this I is wanting to stand independent in the world, needs to, in a way that in previous cultures and societies, it didn't, because consciousness has evolved to where it is today for all of us. And so this I wants to be seen, wants to be known, wants to be free, and can be terribly lonely. And so the work, I think what he's pointing to in this, this lecture is the work is then to find our way back to one another. That is complicated. And you mentioned how can we find in our institutions, in our schools, places where, where we can become kinship and find kinship with the other again. Yeah, not, not as easy as just saying, what do you want from me? but no less important and worth, worth striving for. If we just stayed with our I alone, I think, I think we would actually not fulfill the aims of, of the gods for us, but to find each other again in brotherhood through, through love. I'm gonna close with this beautiful, inspiring, maybe she gets us there a little bit. I don't know, maybe it points us in a direction. This beautiful book I can highly recommend called Braiding Sweetgrass by a botanist <clears throat> named Robin Wall Kimmerer. She's also part of the citizen Potawatomi Nation. And um, she's a professor of botany. She lectures now, I think, quite widely. And she has this, this book full of stories of herself as an educator and her learnings along the way, and beautiful stories about what she's discovered in nature through her wisdom and through, her, through these various paths of knowing, you could say. 
Okay, so I'll tell you a little story. I'll read you a story, bedtime story. <laughs> she was out, this is called The Sound of Silver Bells. She was out, she wanted to take this group of students who, who didn't seem, she didn't have, seemed to have much in common with. She wanted to take them out on a hike to show them, I can't see you all, suddenly I put my glasses on, um, to take them out on a hike to show them all these things in nature that she wanted them to get to know. Darn it, they're gonna get to know these things whether they like it or not, was sort of pushed on, on them. And she went on this hike and she told them all this information and they weren't, didn't seem all that interested. And um, this is what she had to say about it. They were leaving the hike and coming back home. And she says, a hermit thrush sang out from the shadows and a little breeze brought a shower of white petals around us as we walked in that amazing place. They're in the Smoky Mountains. I was suddenly so sad. In that moment, I knew that I had failed. I had failed to teach the kind of science that I had longed for as a young student, seeking the secret of asters and goldenrod, a science deeper than data. I had given them so much information, all the patterns and processes laid on so thick as to obscure the most important truth. I missed my chance, leading them down every path, save the one that matters most. How will people ever care for the fate of moth spiders if we don't teach students to recognize and to respond to the world as a gift? I had told them all about how it works and nothing about what it meant. We may as well have stayed home and read about the Smokies. In effect, against all my prejudices, I had worn a white lab coat into the wilderness. Betrayal is a heavy load, and I plodded along, suddenly weary. I turned to see the students coming down the trail behind me, a petal-strewn path in gauzy light. One person, I don't know who, began to sing ever so quietly, those familiar first notes, the ones that open your throat, irresistibly calling you to sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. One by one, they joined in, singing in the long shadows and a drift of white petals settling on our shoulders. That saved a wretch like me. I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was humbled. Their singing said everything that my well-intentioned lectures did not. On and on they went, adding harmonies as they walked. They understood harmony in a way that I did not. I heard in their raised voices the same outpouring of love and gratitude for the creation that Sky Woman first sang on the back of Turtle Island. In their caress of that old hymn, I came to know that it wasn't naming the source of wonder that mattered. It was wonder itself. Despite my manic efforts and my checklist of scientific names, I knew now that they hadn't missed it all. Was blind, but now I see. And they did, and so did I. If I forget every genus and species I ever knew, I'll never forget that moment. The worst teacher in the world or the best teacher in the world, neither can be heard over the voices of silver bells and hermit thrushes. The rush of waterfalls and the silence of mosses have the last word. As an enthusiastic young PhD colonized by the arrogance of science, I had been fooling myself that I was the only teacher. Paying attention is a form of reciprocity with the living world, receiving the gifts with open eyes and open heart. My job was just to lead them into the presence and ready them to hear. On that smoky afternoon, the mountains taught the students, and the students taught the teacher. Read this book. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you.